this is the worst drought to hit South Africa since 1982. Millions are facing water shortages. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft celebrated the new year by relaying images of an icy object from the far reaches of the solar system, 1.6 billion kilometers beyond Pluto. Over the last 10 years, sea levels have risen at an alarming rate. Biodiversity is reportedly declining faster than that of any time in human history. And millions, millions of people have been affected by extreme weather like hurricanes and floods. A team of physicists claimed its rudimentary quantum computer performed a calculation in 200 seconds that would overwhelm a conventional supercomputer. So I think everybody understands this is just an unbelievable moment in American history. As I speak, there are tens and tens of thousands of people coast to coast marching for racial justice, uh, marching in horrified opposition to the police murder of George Floyd. As we speak right now, as a result of the pandemic and the economic collapse, some 20% of our people are unemployed. That right now in America, when people are losing their jobs, they're also losing their health insurance by the millions. So we don't have to look at this as a death sentence or doom and gloom. We can look at this as a time that we can create a brand new and better future with better jobs, higher paying jobs. So I'm here with Professor Zoltan Bodija Shimon. Professor Shimon is a assistant professor at Leiden University and a research fellow at Bielefeld University. Professor, thank you very much for joining us uh, today and for answering our questions. I'll go straight to the third question right now. One could understand that your insightful ideas about historical time derive from the epistemology of history for both processual and eventual temporalities refer to two different ways of experiencing the phenomenon of historical change, not about time as a phenomenon. From the phenomenological point of view, time would not be only a matter of newness, but fundamentally a matter of becoming. That is, the time that precedes us, and by that I mean the past, is the basis of what can be experienced and hermeneutically justified as something new. With that in mind, how would you explain the phenomenon of unprecedented, not in the key of epistemology of history and historiography, but by means of this kind of phenomenological approach? Well, thank you again for having me here. And again, I will just jump into the question right away, which I think is a very interesting uh, one, because if you turn to the classics or if you turn to, to philosophies of history that have a phenomenological approach, like, like David Carr, for instance, then you find that it's, it's really hard to go beyond who sells uh, analysis of time consciousness. You have retention, you have protension connected over a temporal continuum, much the same uh, way as Kosalek's categories of uh, space of experience and horizon of expectation are connected over a larger temporal continuum, even though the distance is growing uh, between them according to Kosalek. But in both cases, they are supposed to account Husserl and Kosalek respectively for the experience of time on the individual and on the societal level. Now, the phenomenological is, of course, devoted to the viewpoint of the individual, of the experiencing subject. So the question is, how does the unprecedented occur to the individual? And here we stumble into the same difficulty we did with the modern idea of history in the, in the first uh, part, that there is a deep continuity underlying both modern historical thinking and phenomenological approaches to time consciousness. And because of this deep continuity that you can trace in Husserl, on the societal level, you can even trace in, in, in Kosalek. Because of this uh, deep underlying continuity, they are not really able to account for the occurrence of unprecedented. Well, I'm not a phenomenologist, so my, my knowledge is limited. And I'm sure that there are experiments in, in the tradition that work into the direction of solving this problem, like uh, Waldenfels, for example. And I even made use of uh, the work of Tengei, Laszlo Tengei, in the unprecedented change book in that respect. So there are these experiments that, that, that try to resolve the situation and try to account for something that sort of disrupts this, this, this continuity or this kind of, you know, the phenomenological time consciousness that Husserl had. Still, the assumptions of phenomenology can oftentimes come out as, as obstacles. So altogether to account 
for the unprecedented from the first person point of view, I think that one needs to both rely on phenomenology to an extent, but also to disregard some of its basic assumptions to another extent. So what I tried to do in this respect was uh, that I tried to align the notion of experience a bit paradoxically, I try to align it with uh, that which defies all previous experiences. I mean, of course, even this sentence uh, indicates that we use the notion of experience in many ways and in many senses. Otherwise, I couldn't say that yeah, experience is that which defies all previous experiences. It just doesn't make sense. But yeah, it means that now I used the, the word experience in two, uh, in two very different ways. And the notion of experience that I try to focus on is the one that, uh, you know, experience as nonsense, you know, that which does not make sense. Experience as an encounter with something that collapses our cognitive capacities, something unprecedented on the individual level, like eyewitnessing uh, the Trinity test, the first explosion of a nuclear device. So such experience is an encounter with radical novelty, an encounter that literally doesn't make sense. It's an encounter event, as I call it in the book, for those who are eyewitnesses. And again, this event qualifies as an event only in as much as it triggers a momentous change in your worldview, uh, in as much as the encounter, the event, the nonsense, something that you witness and it just doesn't make sense, somehow triggers you to make efforts to engage in sense making exactly because it doesn't make sense. So it's an event in as much as in the end, the encounter brings about radical novelty in terms of sense making a meaning attribution. So it's only as seen from the post event point of view that you recognize it as an event again, the same way as in the societal level. And yes, as you see here, you have the same structure again, but on this level of the first person point of view, it is perhaps much more visible how how the event of temporality is really not a time of, uh, of becoming. So uh, you recourse to the idea of becoming, and I know that it's a very uh, prominent idea, both in recent uh, humanities theories and in contemporary continental philosophy. For some reasons, the idea of becoming is, is typically even branded as something radical. But I think let's, let's just face the fact that becoming is possible only on the condition of a deep underlying continuity. The idea of becoming is an instance of processual temporality. It's, it's a paradigmatically modern thing, the idea of becoming, regardless of the twists and turns that, that the notion receives today, even in, in, in right of this critical posthumanism. But the coming about of radical novelty and unprecedented change is, is not processual, it not just becomes over time. Or at least what I, what I try to show is how this radical novelty of unprecedented change is, yeah, it's not processual, it's eventual. And just to confirm what I think is an expectation in your question, uh, yes, I think that we should be able to account for the unprecedented also from the point of view of phenomenology and from the first person point of view. But it will be very difficult because of the basic assumptions of, uh, of phenomenology that, that needs to be overcome, let's say the founding assumptions of some of the founding assumptions of the tradition. Since historicity itself is not a privilege of historical science, but something embedded in the very being of man, a history of historiography as an analytic of historicity cannot be limited to a history of historical science. An analytic of historicity must investigate the conditions, forms, and functions of the historiographical openings of history, and these openings are always produced in a tension between their structural conditions and events. Thus, such an analytic would have as one of its main functions to clear the historiography of its improperty, or, to put it another way, to collaborate to put the historian back in face of the phenomenon of history, through the denaturing of historical representations and objects that accumulate as a result of science itself. To remind the historian, finally, that our relationship with the past, although necessarily mediated by reified representations, has another more fundamental source, the very experience of history. This project, always open, of an historiographical and anti-historiographical discipline dedicated to the study of historical time, will only have meaning or viability if its practitioners are willing to build and reconstruct its general theoretical conditions, that is, to elaborate a general theory of historicity. And our fourth and last question, 
It is often said that times of crisis are also times of opportunity. In a recent paper published in História da Historiografia, which was also translated to Portuguese, and it's called in English, Do Theorists of History Have a Theory of History? Reflections on a Non-Discipline. In Portuguese, Os Teóricos da História Têm uma Teoria da História? Pergunta. Uh, reflexões sobre uma não-disciplina? You claim in this text that the time is ripe for coming to terms of what can reasonably be expected of theory of history as a field. In the end of this paper, you posit that today we need to develop theories of history adequate to address the global problems of our own times. But in order to do this, we have to have an idea of what such theories may be good for. In your opinion, is it possible that our current crisis can potentially strengthen and make the field of theory and philosophy of history more relevant today? Sure. That's the, that's the short answer. But the current crisis means more than the recent global pandemic. It also means the current anthropocentric crisis and the current technological predicament that we have. So generally speaking, whatever is happening to the, in the world today, yes, definitely. But uh, in order to do that, then theory of history needs to be much more than a philosophy of historical studies, a role into which the field has transitioned in the post-Second World War period. So it was very understandable to see a more modest role after the World Wars collapse the idea of a meaningful historical process. But this, this self-imposed confinement uh, in times of unprecedented change must simply come to an end. And today, literally, everyone makes claims about immense transformations on all fronts. So we are facing these immense transformations in the condition of the Earth system. We are redefining what the human means and even alter the human as a biological life form through the application of advanced technologies. We are expecting to create greater than human general intelligence. We rely on algorithms that we no longer are able to understand, actually. And at the same time, we are revisiting questions of historical injustice, tear down statues and demand change in the socio-political domain, even without knowing what we are exactly up to. So joining to a discussion about this rapidly changing world on all fronts, attempting to provide an understanding of the transformations by mapping these incredible complexities that underlie the interrelation of, uh, of these instances that I just mentioned, it should be something rather self-evident, both for historians and theorists um, of history, that this is, you know, it's all about transformations and historians and theorists of history are dealing with transformations. So it should be rather self-evident that this question sort of needs to be brought back home to historians and, and, um, and theorists and philosophers of history. Now then the question is then how exactly can the field open up? So how can it connect to, to these uh, today's most pressing concerns and how can it address these concerns? Certainly, I do have an agenda for the field in the, in, in the broader sense that we need to address these most pressing issues that arise out of rapid technological, ecological, socio-political, natural, cultural, whatever changes. But I wouldn't want to be prescriptive about uh, what exactly these issues are and how exactly to approach these issues. I mean, that would be preposterous and it would result in the exact opposite of what I hope that the field can achieve. So. I would just like to point out that, yes, a lot of things are happening. Everybody is talking about these transformations. How come that, uh, that theorists of history do not? And they just talk about historians or other people talking about these changes. Well, the good news is that there are already a lot of efforts and that we are already actively renegotiating the field in many ways that actually simply just do not fit with this entire distinction between speculative and, uh, and substantive philosophies of history on the one side and critical or analytical philosophies of history on the other. It's more like that we, we study historical relations to the world in the broadest sense and that we already study historical apprehensions of the world and ourselves in different domains of life. I believe that the field of theory and philosophy of history, on the one hand, and what is called the study of historical cultures, on the other hand, is merging. So historical cultures and theory and philosophy of history is just starting to come together um, in addressing different societal relations to uh, past, present and future. The future not much, but I hope to bring that issue more and more on the agenda. So I have the feeling that these, these two are merging and recent theoretical work on history is neither a philosophy of history in the classical sense of a 
meaningful interpretation of a historical process, nor is it a study of what historians are doing, as it has been in the last half uh, century or so. But it still can entail, and typically it still includes these questions too. It just broadened up. What I see is more like uh, theoretical and historical approaches jointly exploring these manifold relations to past, present and future in contemporary societies. And all the work on the historicity and temporality of the Anthropocene, on the opening toward a natural cultural understanding of the past and the world, on the expansion of historical thinking over the non-human world, all the work on historical time, on memory politics, on historical injustice, on political appropriations of the past, well, for that matter, on political ap appropriations of uh, technological futures, or working on the technological appropriations of political futures, uh, or the technological appropriations of human and posthuman futures. So all these verbs sort of can belong here, and uh, of course many more, still including questions about how the discipline of history does all this. But if you ask me, then then given these complexities arising um, out of um, the Anthropocene predicament that collapses the human and the natural worlds, disciplinary understandings and the disciplinary constitution of the entire modern knowledge regime, so these are becoming less and less compelling. And that must apply to history and the theory of history too, to the field. If we think that the greatest challenge of our time is to make sense of the collision of the human and the natural worlds through through technology, then we need knowledges attuned to investigate the entanglement of, uh, of these worlds. And this entire modern knowledge regime, including history and philosophy of history, was based on the idea of studying the human and the natural world separately. So the whole knowledge regime we have is just not suited for approaching these questions. In that sense, it is very likely that we are facing an immense rearrangement of, uh, of knowledge and it may very well be that neither history as we know it, nor anything like a theory and philosophy of history will stay with us uh, for, for very long as, as knowledge formations. Still, for now, yes, we need to open up uh, theory and philosophy of history to addressing these global and planetary problems of our time. And we need to join to this larger discussion together with other approaches and other knowledge formations which already discuss these immense uh, transformations. But we need to do this by knowing that there's a chance that eventually, on the long run, all this may lead to an entire new knowledge regime with new kinds of expertise uh, that render our present modes of expertise sort of irrelevant. Professor Zoltan Bujijashimon, thank you very much for joining us and for answering our questions. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Our interview is coming to an end. I would like to ask you what you have going on. What are your current publications? What, uh, what are you working on right now? Projects, publications, all that stuff. Yes, um, well, as you mentioned, uh, this um, short book, The Epochal Event, has, um, it is just published a month ago or so. But what is coming is also, uh, also super exciting. And um, I think it's now over three years uh, almost that uh, I started to collaborate with, with Marek Tan. And the first fruits of that collaboration are uh, coming out, which include joint articles. We also have a special issue edited together on historical thinking and the human. So some of the themes that I, things that I mentioned are pretty much part of what we are working on with Marek. And exactly because of these tremendous complexities that we try to understand, we needed to team up. And we also try to involve more and more people to, um, to let's say, develop an understanding of these uh, questions. So there will be the Journal of Philosophy of History, um, a special issue on historical thinking and the human. We have an incredibly interesting uh, lineup for that. You will see in a couple of months. Next year, from the first issue onwards, something is coming with history, uh, with history and theory. And it's also part of our collaborations with Marek. Yes.